Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about autopsies. And the first thing we want to look at is what's the difference between a clinical and forensic autopsy. Clinical autopsies would be for like a family that wants to know why someone may have died unexpected. Uh, they don't ex uh, assume foul play. So they just go about maybe they had a heart disease or something wrong with um, one of their organs. Um, so they're going to look into that. Uh, we also can look at a forensic autopsy where um, this is where foul play is suspected. We have bullet wounds, stab wounds. We may have injuries, blunt force trauma, and, and or we're trying to figure out the difference, uh, whether we believe it's a suicide or a homicide. They can look at um, bullet paths and, and uh, the direction that bullets went into the body or stab wounds, the size of the blade that was used, whether it was serrated or not. We can gather a lot of information from uh, an autopsy. So we would run a forensic autopsy on that to try to gather as much information. During this, you're gonna document everything you see. You're also gonna take a lot of photographs. Um, so photographs of the entire person. We're gonna take up close photographs with a ruler. Um, we're gonna look at um, entry and exit paths for bullets or, or stab wounds. And you're also gonna photograph the entire body even where there are no injuries because we need to look at this and diagnose what may have happened. Where did the injuries happen? Where didn't they happen? We don't, we don't only wanna take photos of the injured areas because let's say they weren't hit anywhere on the right-hand side uh, and they were only hit on their left-hand side. Well, that may help us in the investigation, how they were standing or how they were laying down or who was around them. So we wanna make sure we get um, all of our bases are covered with our photographs and what we're studying during this autopsy, okay? We start with the external examination, which is gonna be photographs. We could take x-rays to see if we have broken bones inside of the body. We're gonna take the body's temperature and take a lot of different um, samples. One of the main samples that we would look at is um, hair samples. We can look at that because if there's other hair that's found on a crime scene or on another person, that can help us make a connection there. We also take hand swabs when you fire a, a, a gun or a firearm, you get, um, ammo or, or residue, gunshot residue on your hands, right? So if we're looking at an apparent suicide by, uh, due to a, a gun being fired, a bullet go through their brain, let's say, and we don't find any gun residue on their, um, gunshot residue on their hands, that tells us this was probably a homicide and not a um, suicide. We can also look on the underside of fingernails, especially during like rape cases, um, the female or male um, would be scratching and clawing a lot. And you can find DNA underneath the fingernails. Um, we can, we will measure the, the wounds. We'll look for entry and exit um, points of bullets. We fingerprint. Um, and then we look at the overall characteristics, tattoos, piercings, all of that stuff has to go into that ex external examination. So we have a general idea as to who this person is or was. And most of that really helps if we have an undetermined person, right? If we don't have a name to the face, this will help us maybe if we talk to the public, um, so-and-so had uh, these different tattoos. Do you know anyone that, that fits that description really? Okay. Then we move internal in the examination. We're gonna make a Y incision like you see here on the screen. So you would start from the shoulder, you would come down to about the mid chest area, the other shoulder down to about the mid chest area, and then all the way down through that midline. And this is so we can study all the organs on the inside here, right? We can also look for bullets on the inside here. We can try to get bullets out um, or if there's anything else on the inside. We can also do toxicology um, studies on uh, any poisons that may have gotten into the body, right? So we'll remove the internal organs. We'll also weigh them. Um, not always, but we can expose the brain to study that if we have to. Um, we don't necessarily have to all the time. Um, we open up the stomach because the stomach can give us evidence as to what this person just ingested. Um, we can, like I said before, look at toxicology, and then we can also look and um, do like vaginal swabs um, to see if there's any uh, possible semen, if it was a rape case or any other DNA that's, that's uh, available for us to study, right? I'm going to link this video, like I said during class. Um, it, it can make some people queasy, so make sure um, if you are feeling anything like that, just shut it off or don't watch it at all if you're that type of person. Okay. Um, so when we look at the stomach, 
we look at, here's our general characteristics uh, upon eating. If we eat something, it usually is in the stomach for anywhere from two to six hours. After six hours, it empties from the stomach. After another 12 hours, so looking at approximately 14 to 18 hours later, it should be out of the small intestine. And then after another six hours, so a full 24 hours, it should be moved pretty much out of the large intestine. And the reason why this is important is let's say we have someone goes out to eat with someone else. Um, they go missing. You ask the person, oh, were you with them at this time? No, I wasn't. I dropped her off. She, you know, went into her house or whatever it is. But we start seeing that they stopped eating at eight o'clock and the food was still in her stomach, right? That tells us, and depending on the digestion amount, it could tell us when she was actually killed um, after eating, right? Was she killed within two to six hours or was it um, after that, right? And the contents of the stomach or anything in the intestines would tell us what she ate or he ate and also how long it's been since she died. Because remember, once once this person dies, all digestion will stop, right? And wherever it is in the digestive system will stay where it is. So we can kind of backtrack from there. The last thing is the change to the eye. Um, this is used, but it's not very concrete evidence, right? So when the body dies, um, or I should say the potassium is, is used sometimes. The surface of the eye is definitely used um, in determining death. So following death, the surface of the eye dries over and a thin film will kind of cover over that eye um, in anywhere from two to three hours. And then um, if the body was killed, the person was killed and their eyes were closed, then that film would take approximately 18 to about 24 hours to, um, to show. So if the eyes are open upon death within two to three hours, they will kind of glaze over and get this thin film to them. And then if we don't see that, we know that the body is uh, recently killed. If we see it, then we know that it's been at least two to three hours. And then we would use liver mortis, rigor mortis, algor mortis to get a better idea, right? The potassium accumulating inside the vitreous humor, that's something that they use, but it's not really concrete because it's a little different. So you have this breakdown of the cells and this releasing of potassium into the fluid back here of the eye. And um, that can give us the concentration of that potassium can give us a better idea as to how long the body's been dead. The higher the concentration, the longer the body's been dead. But like I said, it's not really concrete, but it, uh, it can be used as um, supporting evidence as to when someone died. Okay. So that's all, all there is on um, on autopsies.